So in John chapter 14 and verse 26, it matches with Genesis chapter 5 in which we looked, where in Genesis chapter 5, and uh, let me find that passage real quickly, in Genesis 5 and verse... Uh, 29, verse 29, Genesis 5, 29, Noah is supposed to mean comfort. And the, how this can represent in the sin-infested, cursed world that I've taught you uh, last Genesis study is that in this sin-infested world, technology, civilization, it's all cursed, but God puts a comfort to us. And He gave us a Holy Ghost at John chapter 14, verse 26. The Holy Ghost is a comforter. So, notice that He, will, uh, he shall teach you all things, right? 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3. So, He will teach you all things. So, in other words, everything that you interact in this sin infested world the holy jo uh, the holy ghost excuse me the holy ghost job is to make sure that you are going to be comforted in all things okay and then he's going to guide you through everything so the holy ghost is going to guide you into all truth so a lot of people they get afraid about everything that's going on in our world but you know, uh, you got the Holy Ghost, the greatest comforter. Yeah. So you can live in this sin-infested world. Yeah, really. So don't worry about it. The Lord will guide and lead you into all truth. So the thing is, is that this whole world, mankind might boast and say that this is theirs, but the best that they put in their toil and effort is a curse. But to a Christian, you own already what mankind has built. Wow. This does not belong to them. It belongs to God. All right, they just didn't take good care of it, mankind. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Look at verse 21. Therefore let no man glory in men, for what? All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours. Notice the things of this world, individuals, anything in this life, Anything that is present that you're dealing with, or even in the future, or even after death, all belong to you. So, see, the Holy Ghost's job is that everything that you live in this sin-infested, cursed world, that He's supposed to comfort you through all that. So, I know that during the coronavirus situation, we can see all these uh, restrictions and all this ridiculous stuff going on in California as a curse, but remember this, is that the globalists are not the owners Amen. of this uh, world. The government is not the owner of this world. you got to realize that all these things are ours. So if the Holy Ghost is the one that can guide in anything that we interact with in our world and use it for the glory of God, then that's something to rejoice. So then these restrictions and then the coronavirus situation and all that, it is used for the glory of God in what sense? Maybe people being more responsive to street preaching now? People yeah. being more responsive about the salvation of their soul. Yes. Finally, we got some of you coming to church. We go. All right. I don't mean to kick, but you know what I'm driving at. The point is, is that, see, because of this kind of frustration and lockdown, mm -hmm. the Lord used it for His glory where it could even benefit us. Amen. See that? The so the thing is, is that you have to understand that no matter what bad thing that we go through in life, the Holy Spirit's job is to comfort us through anything, anything in this wicked earth that we go through. Yeah. That's why God says in the promise of Romans 8, 28, when we know that all things work together for good. Amen. So all things. Yeah. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. So we have to understand that even if you suffer a great detrimental tragedy in your life, the Lord can work it for good. Because that's the Holy Spirit's job is to comfort you. Alright. Now we're going to go back to Genesis. Chapter 5 again. Alright, that should encourage you. Amen. That should encourage you. Alright. I forgot to erase this. But anyway. Alright. That's for all the world to see. Alright. Genesis chapter 5. Alright. Genesis chapter 5. We're going to read verse 30. Verse 30. 
And Lamech lived after he begat Noah 590 and 5 years. So after Lamech uh, was able to, through his wife, give birth to Noah, he lived about 590 and 5 years after Noah was born. And then, and begat sons and daughters. So he was able, through his wife, give birth to sons and daughters as well. And all the days of Lamech were 770 and 7 years, and he died. So Noah said all the days that Lamech lived in totality was 7 and a 7 and a 7, wow. and then he passed away. Yeah. Now isn't that something there? Yep. Notice that was when at after 777, Noah was it. And God said, okay, that's the end of the earth. Why? Because seven is completion. Seven is the end there. For so, so for some people who didn't know, seven is God's number. Now you might recall this, but let me repeat a little bit again. So go to Genesis again. Go to Genesis again. Genesis chapter 2. Go to Genesis chapter 2. We go to Genesis chapter 2. Now look what the Bible says concerning about the number 7. That God, what did He do? He did something with 7. So that's why we Bible-believing Christians have to keep an eye out on 7. Because God blessed and sanctified it. So that's very important. When it talks about the seventh day, you got to keep an eye out on that. Sometimes the Lord will mention it will go seven days long. And sometimes the Lord will mention certain festivals will go seven times seven times seven years or something like that. So you have to keep an eye out for the timeline of seven. And another evidence is Lamech's death. Notice that seven, seven, seven years. And that was it. God ended it and he's like, okay, the earth is done. Creation is done, and I'm going to send the flood. Isn't that when creation was done on the seventh day? So then Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. But it's, it shows that the Lord just doesn't stop there. Verse 3, he did something to the seventh yep. timetable. Yep. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. Because that in it he had rested from all his works which God created and made. So notice here the Lord did something with the timetable of seven. And I've taught you last time that seventh day will, Adventists will use this as proof of Sabbath day. But notice that the Sabbath was not even implemented here. It's just talking about seventh day. And seventh day Adventists, they limit God's blessing on the seventh day. Just by saying Sabbath. Sabbath is inclusive. It's only a part of the huge blessings that the Lord put on the timetable of seventh day. That's why God later on made a big deal about the Sabbath and put a command. Why? Because a long time ago he made a big deal about the timetable of seven. Okay, let's go back to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. So you can see from this picture that pretty much the whole world is going to hell. And this is just a horrible timetable. It's a horrible timetable that uh, the world is living under. But there's something going on here. Alright, so let's keep reading. We're going we're gonna to finish off the generations first. Then we're going to talk about these beings. At verse 32, And Noah was 500 years old. And Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Notice that Noah, that... He is 500 years old, and then notice during that time he already gave birth uh, through his wife, three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So, obviously that's where our entire world came from, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sociology even talks about, and we'll talk about a little bit more, but sociology even talks about where there are three branches, and they uh, labeled it where it was Caucasian and Negroid and um, uh, Mongoloid. But because of the cultural atmosphere where they keep uh, any term becomes very sensitive, uh, Mongoloid is deemed wrong and obviously the black race is deemed wrong through Ham's line, but not even that Caucasian is also deemed wrong. So they keep revising the terms and the words and then it'll be a never-ending story. I guarantee you this, when one group is content with the label, it's not going to stop there. It's going to keep changing. 
Mark my words. And if you think that I'm wrong, then you have not been looking back in, back in the past just five years alone. Five years alone. Even the LGBTQ crowd, they keep changing their terms. And what's so hilarious is that where you have this uh, homosexual couple or group, they feel bad if they offended the transvestite group because they've been labeled wrongly. So you notice this, th this is the never-ending story. So you're, no matter what term you're going to use, it's going to be labeled incorrect. Mark my words, okay? I can't tell you how many times in my liberal papers I had to revise the terms every stinking time. Like every stinking time. So it'll never, it'll never end. It'll never end. But anyway, the point is, okay, I'm not, talking, I'm not talking about a justification of labels or something like that. My point is, is that even sociology 101 recognizes and supports the truth of the Bible that basically every ethnicity and nationality we come from will be divided into three main groups. And then it fulfills scripture, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's where we all come from. Okay, so now that we see this, notice that all of this is uh, starting at 7, but also Noah was 500. You notice, what is 5 the number, remember? It's death. So 5 is the number of death, if you might recall. So 5 being the number of death, you can see that, yep, the world's about to die. The Lord's going to send the flood. The time is up for mankind. All right, so Genesis 6, you ready for this? Here we go, the deep part. And it came to pass, so uh, a good start to phrase, uh, to start out, you know, basically like the story, you know. Later on in life, or a long time ago, and it came to pass, you know, what happened? When men began to multiply on the face of the earth, so when mankind was growing and spreading out throughout the world, earth and daughters were born unto them so notice that daughters were being born from mankind humankind and then verse 2 that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair so notice that there's a group called sons of God and they looked down and they saw that these daughters that the humans brought forth that they were fair and beautiful and they took them wives of all which they chose so then, they start to take uh, any wife or woman that they wanted to have as their wife. So notice that they were doing that, and they did whatever they chose. So, uh, now, this is a wrong teaching that is taught by uh, mainstream Christian, uh, well, not mainstream, but what is sad is that the independent fundamental Baptist church who should know better, they mess up in this teaching. Uh, I can't really say mainstream Christianity teaches this part because mainstream Christianity, there's half of it that believes in this truth that Bible believers have taught, and there's another half who don't believe in it. So this teaching should not be heretical or strange because mainstream Christianity, they have a different viewpoint of Genesis 6. But mainstream, independent, fundamental, Baptist, King James only churches... They mess up in this teaching. Can you believe that? When they should know better. That shows their lack of knowledge of the scriptures. So Genesis 6 is taught wrongly that the sons of God are actually the line of Seth. So remember there were uh, two lines that I've taught to you that uh, Cain had his civilization and then Adam was doing his civilization through Seth. So they called the sons of God uh, Seth's line. And then they called uh, the daughters of uh, uh, men, they called that Cain's line. So they labeled it that way. But this is totally distorted and it does not make sense. The reason why is, verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bear children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Notice here that the sons of God gave birth to these giants. That's where you get the idea of giants, and then cyclops, and etc. So, knowing that that's what gave birth through the sons of God, then obviously this is not some kind of normal human being. By the way, they didn't really pay attention to the verse. 
If you look at uh, verse 1, did you hear what I explained? When men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. That's where your daughters of men are. This is mankind already spreading out. This is the entire human race here. But then notice these other beings, which are called sons of God at verse 2, they intermingled with mankind's women. It's that simple. So, look at Job 39. Job 39. Now, the scripture makes it pretty obvious that these are not normal human beings. These are definitely angelic beings. Angelic beings. Now, angels do not have wings, just to let you know, but I just drew it there because that's the perception of people, so that way you guys don't get confused. If I erase the ring, you'll think it's a normal human being, okay? So I'm just going to put a wing in there. So uh, angels don't have wings. For some of you who might be in shock, that's a different teaching, all right? I'm not going to expound it here. Job 39, the Bible reads here, this is what God said about... Uh, the sons of God. But look at Job 38, excuse me. Job 38 is better. Job 38. The Bible says at verse 6 of Job 38, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or laid the cornerstone thereof. So right when God laid the foundation of the earth, at verse 4, right? Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? God is speaking to Job. Where were you, mankind? Right? Where were you, mankind, when I laid the foundation of the earth? You weren't there. But who was there at verse 7 when the foundation was fastened? Verse 7, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. See that? Mankind was not present when the foundations of the earth were laid. God said, where were you? You weren't there. But he mentioned that those sons of God were. See, so then the sons of God are definitely different from mankind. There is no doubt. These are referring to the angels. And then in this case, because they fell down on the earth to mingle with the humans, more specifically, fallen angels. Wow. Now, uh, they're going to use Matthew 22. Go to Matthew 22. So they're going to use Matthew 22 on you. Claiming that uh, angels are sexless, that they cannot... Uh, reproduce. But that is not true. Pay attention to your Bible. Look at Matthew chapter 22. They weren't reading the scriptures. Look at Matthew chapter 22 and verse 30. Verse 30. It did not say that angels were sexless. Look at Matthew 22 verse 30. This is the verse they're going to use. Now pay attention. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. It just simply say that they don't marry in heaven. It's that simple. Why do you think the sons of God came down on the earth to intermingle with the humans? Because you can't marry up in heaven. See that? It's that simple. Uh, look at Jude. Jude. Even, even if we were to take for granted, take for granted that those angelic beings, that they are sexless, the Bible shows that their state changed. Their angelic state changed when they intermingled with the humans. What? That's not scripture. You don't read your Bible. Look at Jude. Look at Jude chapter 1. Look at verse 5. Uh, verse 6. Verse 6. And the angels which what? Kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. Why? Because up in their habitation, they're not given in marriage. So then they had to leave their habitation. And what happened? Their first estate changed. And what did God do with these fallen angels? He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the, judge, uh, unto the judgment of the great day. See, he put them bound. Why? Because Noah's flood did a toll on them. All right. Understanding that, now going back to Genesis 6. Going back to Genesis 6. So what we do know is this is that this poor unfortunate female here is being intermingled by these sons of God. Now, these sons of God, the thing is this, is that what took place in their transformation? That's what you want to look at, right? Something happened where there was a transformation going on. 
But we just don't know what this transformation is. Jude told you that, right? Yeah, there's a transformation. What is this transformation? Well, what, one of the clues that we do know what they had to transform was that they had to have human blood. Because look at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. All right. Now, uh, that's why I encourage people to go to a Bible-believing church. Because uh, all I get my knowledge from is not just from myself. It is from Bible-believing preachers and teachers. Now, this, te this teaching is from one Bible-believing pastor that I got, actually. It's a really good golden nugget. So I'm going to open up that possibility. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's start off right here. The Bible says at verse 50 that celestial, angelic, heavenly beings do not have blood. It's not allowed in heaven. Verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and what? Blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So notice here that the, this incorruptible or heavenly state that it should have no blood. That's why God said He's going to change our body at verse 53, 54. Our human state is going to be transformed. Yeah. Why? Because God sees our current state as corruptible. Yeah. And what does He tie our corruptible state with? Blood. Yep. So that shows that the angelic beings, they had no blood. But then when they transformed their state, they had to intake blood then. But then that brings up the question, one by one by one, okay? Let's do this. Now, we know mankind has blood, right? But did you recall my teaching at Genesis 3, or did you kind of forget at Genesis 2 and 3 what I taught you? So, mankind, if you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, okay? Adam... Okay, 1 Corinthians 15 says flesh and blood, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what it said? Okay, flesh and blood. Now, blood is tied to corruption, correct? Yes. All right. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Now, let's see verses here, all right? Verses. When we do verses here, let's talk about our incorruptible state then, all right? Incorruptible state would have no blood then. And it would not say flesh and blood then. It might be worded something else. When, think about mankind's last incorruptible state. Adam and Eve. Go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. It doesn't say flesh and blood. It had to erase blood. Flesh and bone. Flesh and bone. Look at the book of Genesis 2. Genesis 2. Verse, tw uh, verse 22, 22. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, if she's supposed to be woman from man, why not take his blood? See that? I mean, that's the most common sense. It's got to... I mean, uh, everybody, they trace DNA and then they do blood. I mean, that's an essential for life. The Bible says life of the flesh is in the blood. But right here, when woman was born, blood is not mentioned once. Blood is not mentioned at all until death. Yeah, wow. Not life, death. Abel, his blood was spilled on the ground. Lambs, animals die, shed their blood. How about that? So we see right here then that there... Why? Because it's tied to corruption. It's tied to corruption. So it's flesh and bone. Flesh and bone in our incorruptible state. Wait a minute. If Adam and Eve had no blood, that means, when did they have blood? Remember a little bit what I've told you. There, so we do know that it's tied to corruption, blood, right? Which means then, until they sinned, or when they got corrupted, then they got the blood. When did they have sin on them? When they partook in a certain fruit. In a certain fruit. And it wasn't an apple. 
I showed you last time, there is only one fruit, okay, think about this now, there is only one fruit in the Bible that would be, con that mentions blood, and it also symbolizes blood, and it also is used for sin. Not just a positive context, but a negative context. If you're going to commit a certain sin, it's by this one particular fruit. And that is grapes. Yeah. Why? Because of the wine. Yeah. Because of the wine. That's, right. That's the reason why. So uh, Noah, he, what did he do? He planted, uh, he planted vineyard and then produced wine from the grapes. And then he sinned. Yep. That's uh, Noah's only record of sinning, actually, is by a fruit. The only fruit you can think of is the best candidate. Best candidate for the most mention of sin is the grape. And grape is the one that's mentioned with blood. Specifically the word blood of this particular fruit. And not only that, it's symbolized as well with blood. So there is no doubt that they ate grapes at the Garden of Eden. And that's the only fruit that makes the most sense. Otherwise, I would like to know another fruit. But the other fruit will have no scriptural evidence compared to the grape. The grape is the best candidate. Yeah. So, understanding that, that's how they receive the blood. Wait a minute then. Could these angelic beings ate the fruit? And that's how they got their human blood. Wow. Could it be possible? Well, who is the tree in the Garden of Eden? Did you forget? Ezekiel 31. I mean, if that wicked being, Satan, wants them to intermingle and ruin the messianic bloodline with his own bloodline, it's not a problem for the serpent at the garden or, you know, with that tree, take, pluck out a fruit and say, here, why don't you have a bite? To his minions. Look at Ezekiel 31. Ezekiel chapter 31. Look at the wording here. The wording here is undoubtedly a, a being that is demonic. Verse 7. Thus was he fair in his greatness. Verse 8. The cedars in the garden of God cannot hide him. See that? Look at that. So this is no doubt the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but it's an evil tree. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches, nor any tree in the garden of God was like unto him in his beauty. It's labeled as a person. Do you remember Ezekiel 28? If you recall Ezekiel 28, it was talking about Satan the cherub who was beautiful, and he was in the garden of Eden as well. So then we see right here at Ezekiel chapter 31 that this is undoubtedly in context referring to Satan, but then he is labeled with this tree. I have made him fair, uh, verse 9, but I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. How about that? There was a one evil tree in the garden of Eden. That is in context with Satan when you look at Ezekiel 28. And the only, what is the evil tree in the garden? We know what that is. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So understanding that, that's why Satan is that tree. So he can give that fruit. It's not a problem for him to give that fruit to the sons of God. But remember what I told you. God, he didn't want uh, Adam and Eve to partake in the tree of life. Why? Because if they partook in the tree of life, then they would live forever with that tree of knowledge of good and evil in them. And so they'd be basically walking out as immortals with a, a basically immortal demon, so to speak, roaming around the earth. Forever with that uh, sin nature from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and that immortality. Wait a minute. That's as demonic as you can get right here. These are eternal beings here. So look at Revelation. Look at Revelation 22. Revelation 22. The Bible says that the tree of life, it's not given freely. Originally, it was at the Garden of Eden. But God had to switch it now. 
Why? Because God knows is that if mankind with this sin nature, if sin nature is in there and he partakes in the tree of life, you're doomed. You're doomed. So God says that you have to stay away from sin. You have to be pure. You have to keep the commandments so that, why? Then you qualify to eat the tree of life. Otherwise, if you don't keep the commandments and you sin, then with that sin nature, when you take the tree of life, what are you? Just like Adam and Eve could have done after eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil and combining it with the tree of life, immortal demons. So look at the wording here, Revelation 22, 14 and 15. And I taught you this last time too with this verse. Blessed are they that do His commandments. See that? It's not free. You have to do the commandments. That they may have right to the tree of life. Look at that. So that you can qualify yeah. to the tree of life. Why? The ones who don't qualify in keeping the commandments are labeled as what? At verse 15. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and make it a lie. Yeah. Why? If there's a being that can qualify for all that besides human beings, it's angelic beings. Those demons. Those devils commit all kinds of sinful atrocities. So they do not qualify to the tree of life. But remember this. These angelic beings that they were in a sinless state before. They were in a sinless state before. They had a tree of life before and they were living eternally before. So guess what? These angelic beings, they partook in the tree of life. But then what happened? They failed. They failed in allowing sin nature inside them and followed the devil. And then they became fallen beings. But worse than that, by taking partaking in that fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they completed this atrocity right here. Wow. The atrocity of a demonic offspring. No wonder God had to drown everything out. Because... If you think mankind is bad as it is, we're not... Okay, I know that we're like intermingling with all kinds of things out there and then, you know, now it's becoming 50 different colors of the rainbow with, within the gender nature and all that. But we're not at Genesis 6 yet. God is waiting for that. Okay, so this monstrous atrocities, you ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, science, say they have no problem with intermingling stuff now. Combine science with uh, the lifestyle yeah. and sexual lifestyle of people today. Guess what we can accomplish together? A demonic, wicked thing. Yeah. That's what's going to happen. Because they now planted treatments where people can intermingle and do all sorts of disgusting fornication and you don't have to suffer the consequences of the disease. They're, they're creating scientific machinery for that one. It's unthinkable. Some of the stuff that I hear from my liberal college is just shocking to me. And I go, wow, they already have a technology in place where they can... Uh, where uh, the people who have same-sex relationships, they don't have to suffer AIDS as a consequence. I've heard about some machines like that now. It shocked me, but it's not really in public domain yet. It's only through a certain word of mouth, through a certain word of mouth, through professors who have connections. Get ready. You ain't seen nothing yet. All right, you think this is bad? We're at Genesis 5. There's no doubt about that, right? We read Genesis 5. We're just waiting for Genesis 6. You know where we are at Genesis 5? Right here, comfort. In this wicked day and age of technology, civilization rising through Cain. But then those sons of God, they're just waiting a little more to come down. Get ready. Alright. So, we see right here, at Genesis 6, 1 through 2, that that's what uh, could have happened. But that's possibility 1. Possibility one is that they could have partaken in the fruit. Possibility two, which some of you might not know, possibility two could be that they were intaking human blood. So if they didn't intake human blood from off the tree, then they could have intaked human blood from other humans. I mean, it's just common sense. The Bible says life of the flesh is in the blood. When people want to live, there's a thing called blood transfusion or trying to retain as much blood as you can. So it would be common sense that if these angelic beings want to live on the earth and intermingle and create life, that they're going to have to take human blood from them. So then it's very interesting. You see these sci-fi shows of some kind of weird heavenly beings or aliens just sucking up human blood. 
in War of the Worlds, for example. Or you see these mythologies about vampires. And these vampires right here, that, they're, uh, that they take women for some weird reason. It's women, right? For some weird reason, it's women. And then what they do with the women, very strange thing indeed, is that they try to suck up their human blood. So it is a very strange thing. Very strange thing here. But that's what these sons of God could have done. They just go, <sighs> like that. And then just intake human blood for themselves. And they produce, and once they intake the human blood, they can produce their offspring. Yeah, so this is just the epitome of evil itself. It's the epitome of evil itself. And then the devil, he's just... Uh, yeah, it's very crazy. It's very crazy. He's just waiting now a little longer for mankind to become a little bit more evil. Wow. How much more evil can you get, right? How much more evil can you get? It makes you want to pray even so come Lord Jesus. Yeah. All right. Let's look at uh, Genesis 6. Genesis 6. Verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man. So God is speaking here, the Lord God Jehovah, He is speaking here that my own spirit, it's not going to always strive res uh, and always fight and resist and go in this conflict with mankind. Why? Because for that He also is flesh. Because God recognizes He's just human flesh. Being human flesh, born with the sinful nature, I've got to realize that this is how they are. And because of that, I can't put up with them anymore. I've got to do something. And that's the reason why he sent Noah's flood. Thank God for your case and my case, he sent in Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah, because yeah, he could have sent another Noah's flood. Yeah. But in this case, he's like, I'm going to send in Noah's flood. I can't put up with this foolishness anymore. So notice that his spirit strives with man. Now, how can Calvinists win in this verse? Now, what is Calvinism? Remember, Calvinism, they teach that mankind does not have free will. So, because they do not believe that mankind has free will, and they believe that basically that everything is under the control of God's sovereignty, so then whenever mankind or you save Christians uh, make a choice or you got saved, it's not because of your free choice, it's because God somehow forced you to do that and etc. Now, that is ridiculous, obviously. There's no such thing. Because you have the free choice to reject him or accept him. Yeah. So then, what about these people who reject him then? So it shows that God must be a cruel God then. Where he would pick and choose certain people who would have them receive him for salvation. And then the other people, he won't help them out and let them die and burn in hell for eternity. That's a cruel God. So, the Calvinists thank God that they're wrong. What we can see is wrong over here is because the Bible points out that the Lord says that he's, his spirit is striving with man. Now, the Calvinists, they teach a heretical doctrine about regeneration. Now, we believe in regeneration, but not the Calvinist way of regeneration. In regeneration, they say the Holy Ghost is going to regenerate you, but we believe that's on salvation. When we get saved, then he makes us alive. That's why we're born again. But Calvinists teach it's before you get saved. So the Holy Spirit somehow makes you born or woken up inside and regenerated, which causes you to believe on Jesus Christ for salvation, and that's heretical. That's heretical. God will not regenerate you until you believe on His Son for salvation, right. until you receive Him, yep. until you're a saved child of God. Amen. So until you make that choice yourself. Otherwise, uh, He can't really blame you when He damns you to hell. Because when He damns you to hell, it's because you rejected my Son. That should be the plain answer. Not that because I didn't regenerate you. On the, what, what kind of a God is that? So we see here that if the Holy Spirit is involved in regeneration first, how come the Holy Spirit was striving here? Look at that verse, verse 3. The Holy Spirit is striving here, but for some weird reason, I guess mankind is more powerful than God then and overthrow overthrew God's sovereignty because their spirit is stronger than God's spirit. See that? It shows your mankind can resist. 
It shows that mankind can resist, but it also shows that God is not so weak as to say, well, I'm sovereign, but in this case right here, I guess mankind's spirit was greater than my spirit. Of course that don't mean that. It just simply shows that God gave mankind a free choice. Yeah. And then His Holy Spirit was working, hoping to convict them, and they would make a free choice to accept and be receptive to His Holy Spirit, but their spirit kept resisting and refusing Him. That's, right. That's the thing. So we see here that God's Spirit was striving with mankind. So Calvinism is out the window. Now, keep reading here. Notice that the Bible reads, Because that they are flesh, they are humans, the latter part of verse 3 says, Yet his day shall be an hundred and twenty years. So, God gives them a chance and let them slide, saying that their days, that how long they will live, is going to be a hundred twenty years long. So, remember at Genesis 5, they were living about uh, 900 years, right? So then, through Shem, Ham, and Japheth, we saw Lamech. He died 777. And then Noah. And then Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, within this uh, genealogy of mankind, we see here that they were going by 900s. But then, the Lord, He points out that we're going to drop it to 120. So, if you notice, after Noah's flood, the timeline was shrinking. And as a matter of fact, uh, Moses, he died just around 120, if not 120. So, the Lord, he pointed out here that mankind, because why? They're flesh, right? At verse 3. So, he knows that the longer mankind lives, what do you think? The greater chances you are in sinning and displeasing Him. That's the reason why we want to be raptured early, right? Because why? It's because we're sick and tired of letting Him down, yeah, I mean, of yeah. sinning. Yeah. Even at our best, mankind is altogether vanity. Yeah. So that's the reason why God understands human fleshly nature. So then He cuts the time short. So He cuts the time shorter. However, I think Dr. Ruckman, he teaches differently. So that's possibility one. Possibility two is that Dr. Ruckman, he points out a weakness. Notice that God said that currently during their timeline. During, during, currently during a timeline, they were living 900 years, 500 years. So he mentioned that they would be 120 years, but that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Why? It's because uh, the promise, uh, this thing, would probably be applied to something else maybe. It would probably be applied to something else. Now some people, they, want, they probably might connect verse 3 with uh, Genesis 7 and Genesis 6 where Noah was building an ark. So when Noah was building an ark, God was giving them some time. So, but I'm not sure and I, uh, about this 120-year gap. So Dr. Ruckman, it, he says right here, it's weiß meaning that he doesn't know. But he pointed out that the teaching here about dropping their, uh, lo uh, their longevity to 120s, that there's a certain weakness to this argument. So as a Bible-believing pastor, what I'm doing is I'm giving you everything out there as a doctrine and the possibilities. Why? So that you can search the scriptures yourself and grow. So that's what a, the joy of a Bible-believing Christian is. Alright. Now we go to verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. So during those days when the sons of God, that they were intermingling and mankind was sinning against God, the Bible points out that there were giants. See that right here that I drew? So there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, so pointing out another thing to keep in mind, so also, right, so God's saying another thing to keep in mind is that after when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, they were uh, intermingling with the daughters of humans, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So these same offspring that came out from this intermingling of the sons of God and women, the, the women gave birth to children, and these children were the same, from verse 4, the giants. 
So they were the same from the giants that became what? Mighty men which were of old, men of renown. They became mighty men. And from old time, ancient times, they became legends, myths. See that? And today's movies, the idea, it carried on. Men of renown. So they became renowned, famous. So that's what happened. That's why Genesis 6 is the birth of everything that you see in sci-fi and fantasy and mythologies, folklore and everything. It's all Genesis 6. Now, there are some people who do not believe in this intermingling of the sons of God with humans and then giving birth to giants. Their argument in verse 4 is this. They're arguing that, no, the intermingling is not the result where giants were born. They say this, no, giants were in the earth in those days, during that time. It's just simply pointing out there were giants who existed that time. And then, after that, the sons of God were intermingling. Because look at verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days. See that? So, simply pointing out that it was giants first, and also after that. See, after the giants were there on the earth... Then the sons of God intermingled with the daughters of the humans and then gave birth to children which became mighty people. So that's their way around it. And then when they talk about giant, if you uh, look up at uh, online, it's pretty obvious we do have giants. And there were giants throughout history. But what they're perceiving as giant is something like, you know, uh, maybe like 10 feet tall or something like that. Nothing like where it becomes very colossal, like mythology or folklore. So that's what the critics uh, argue. So then the giants that you're perceiving or you're seeing here is totally just a way out of line. That's what they see it as. But no, I don't see it that way. Because the reason why is, one, we establish sons of God are undoubtedly angelic beings. And if these are angelic beings, look, this, this ain't normal offspring that they're going to produce. That's one. Number two, they weren't reading the verse as it says. Verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days, semicolon. You see that? God is talking about, look, there are giants in the earth during that time, but then he's explaining more now after that. How this happened. Why? Because he separated with the semicolon. It's like saying that uh, I have 200 people in my church, and then period, and then after that I give a longer sentence how I got the 200 people. That's what this verse 4 is doing. It's talking about there were giants in the earth during that time. And then separate idea. Then it's giving a further explanation how this happened. So then look at the next part. Their excuses and also after that, right? So they, the critics say also after that, meaning after the giants were in the earth that day, then the sons of God intermingled. See, that's their line. But no, that doesn't make sense. Because, and also after that, it doesn't separate. It says, comma, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, comma, and they bear children to them. Look at that. So, also after that is being explained by when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men. How do you know that? Because comma, that's the job of a comma. The job of a comma is to expound it a little more. So it's supposed to expound it a little more. And also after that. What does that mean after that? After that is meaning when the sons of God intermingled with the daughters. After that, they did that. Because why do you need that? You need also after that for when the sons of God came on to the daughters of men and they bare children to them. Because it's explaining this next line. The same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. See that? That's why and also after that is inserted there. Why? Because it's pointing out after this intermingling, what happened? These same individuals became mighty men and famous and legendary. And not only that, Scripture with Scripture proves that. Look at, look at the Scripture with Scripture here. Look at uh, 1 Samuel 16 and Deuteronomy 2. 1 Samuel 16 and then we'll look at Deuteronomy 2. We're going to look at 1 Samuel 16 and Deuteronomy 2. Now, if you look at these two passages here, 
Notice that the giants that they did meet up to Genesis 6, what? Becoming legendary myths and tales. See that? When they explain mighty men which were of old, men of renown, they're just seeing, simply saying, oh, they just gave birth to famous people. But see, the Bible gives something more specific. The Bible shows scripture with scripture. The critics don't have scripture with scriptural proof for this one, but we do. Scripture with scriptural proof shows that it is actually the giants that meet up the, the standard of becoming famous. Being tales that were told and accounts that were told. Because look at 1 Samuel 16. It's describing the giants, not just normal human people. 1 Samuel chapter 16. And then uh, 1 Samuel 17, excuse me, 1 Samuel 17. And then notice at verse 4. And there went out a what? Champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. Why Genesis 6 pointed out the same became mighty men were old men of renown. See that? Mighty men, right? The Bible labels 1 Samuel 16 champion. See that? But Deuteronomy 2 is even more telling. Look at Deuteronomy 2. Deuteronomy 2. Notice that these were stories that were passed down. Genesis 6 says that, these, that this offspring had to have legends or tales or stories passed down, right? That were spreading out. The ones that uh, qualify from comparing Scripture with Scripture is the giants here. It's the giants. So look at Deuteronomy chapter 2 and verse 20. That also was accounted, see that? Accounted. A land of giants. Giants dwelt therein in old time. How about that? Verse 21. A people great and many and tall as the Anakims. Uh, let's also read down at verse... Uh, well, that should be enough. That should be enough. But you'll notice here that this passage shows that... See? The giants were the ones who had... The mighty men were of old men of renown. That phrase fits more to them. So we have scripture with scripture... Not only that, we have reading the verse as it says, Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. But not only that, context. Why context? Because then, who, if you're thinking that these are just normal human beings, and it's the line of Seth intermingling with the line of Cain, we already debunked that at verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 and 2 showed you that daughters of men were referring, were referring to all the human race already. And that the sons of God were establishing the angelic human beings. See that? So we see more and more through evidence of context, Scripture with Scripture, and reading the verse as it says, that this, what you're seeing right now, is true. This is scriptural truth. I mean, if you believe in demonic beings, or Daniel, that he saw a creature and a dragon with seven heads and stuff like that, this shouldn't be surprising. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why this is surprising or hard to swallow. Yeah. You don't think devils cannot produce this kind of stuff? Okay, let's look at Genesis chapter 6. And we shall end right there, okay? So we shall end right there. All right, I was going to talk about this part right here, these two right here. There's a reason why these two are here, uh, but we'll continue on in our next Genesis 6 study. So, I trust I'll see you next Sunday then, all right? Because <laughs> you don't want to miss that one out. All right, but also a good preaching, which I didn't get to cover today, sadly. So, you'll cover it next Sunday. God, my Father, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers, and I pray that... Um, the, everything that we've learned will grow in knowledge and that we'll be able to understand every word in that book. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll bless the remaining time, the fellowship, and everything that we say and do. May it glorify you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.